you've got me curious, Tech. What's on tap for tonight? Service on the alternator, Alan. It's an AC generator that's Chrysler Corporation built. And another first for Chrysler in the standard production passenger car industry. The alternator is used only on the Valiant and Imperial models built in the United States. Now. But don't be surprised to see it on other cars soon. Canada already is using it in Valiant taxi cabs. Uh-oh. Guess we'd better learn about it right quick, huh? There's no guess about it, Alan. Here's why the alternator is being used. Many owners drive in heavy traffic. All electrical accessories are on, and the battery has to work overtime. Under low-speed driving like that, a standard DC generator may not produce enough output to keep a battery fully charged. Now, it's true that there are special DC generators available that can provide more output at low engine speeds, but those special DC generators are much bigger and heavier. Size and weight are getting mighty important, considering all the other things under the hood. Okay, that I buy. Hey, this alternator isn't so big now that I look it over. Right. It's about nine pounds lighter than the standard generator and has a charging output at idle speed. Incidentally, the alternator and DC generator have a lot in common. They both produce voltage and electric current by the process of induction. And you know about the principle of induction. Oh, you mean that bit about voltage being induced in a conductor when the conductor is moved so that it cuts across a magnetic field? Yeah. And voltage is also induced when the magnetic field is moved so that it cuts across the conductor. Either way, the principle is the same. Yeah, Tech's right. In a DC generator, the field stays put, and the conductor, which is the armature, moves. At the same time, the commutator and brushes that connect the turning armature with the charging circuit do a mighty interesting job. They pick up current from the commutator segments when it's flowing in only one direction. In other words, the brushes pick up direct current and make it available for the external circuit. Very clear. I suppose the alternator also delivers direct current. You suppose right, eh, Barney? Yep. Let's look at the alternator construction a minute. The part that contains the conductors and is stationary is called the stator. It's located between the alternator end frames. The field part that rotates is called the rotor. It's located inside the stator. Stator, stationary, rotor, rotating. Clear enough? Crystal clear, man. Carry on. <laughs> okay. Now, as the field or rotor turns, it generates voltage in the stator. Alternating current is flowing in the stator. As a result, connecting the stator to an external charging circuit would provide alternating current that cannot be used to charge the battery. So the alternator needs something between the stator and the output terminal that will convert AC into DC for use on the car, something that will rectify AC. The DC generator, remember, has a commutator and brush arrangement. With our alternator, current is rectified by connecting the stator windings to six silicon diode rectifiers pressed into the end frame. Diode rectifiers, huh? Well, just how do they change AC into DC? How about first telling Alan what a diode rectifier is? Yeah, that's a good idea, Tech. Basically, a diode rectifier is a one-way flow valve. It has low electrical resistance to current flow in one direction and very high resistance to current flow in the other direction. Now, three of the rectifiers used in our alternator are positive. They permit current to flow from the lead wire to the base of the rectifier. These three positive rectifiers are pressed into a die-cast aluminum holder called a heat sink. The heat sink is electrically insulated from the alternator end frame. Its function is to carry heat away from the rectifiers and transfer it to the air. All three positive rectifiers are electrically connected through the heat sink to the alternator output terminal. Therefore, rectified current is available at the output or battery terminal. Now, the other three rectifiers are negative. They are pressed directly into the end frame. These rectifiers permit current to flow from the battery negative terminal through the grounded alternator end frame, through the rectifier base, to the lead wire, and into the stator winding, thereby completing the circuit. By this time, it should be clear that the alternator is different in construction and operation from the conventional generator, even though the end result is the same. Now, because of these differences, diagnosis, testing, and adjustment 
are fairly simple operations. There are new procedures to learn, of course, but you'll find them easy to understand. Uh, I've got no quarrel with that, Barney. And I'm as anxious as the next guy to get up to date on the story. Well, good. Now, uh, you've got an idea of how the alternator differs in construction and operation. You also know that six rectifiers convert AC into DC necessary for use on the car. Alan still needs to know how alternator output is controlled, how the regulator differs. Oh, yeah, Tech. One big difference is that the alternator uses a single unit regulator. Now, just as a reminder, the DC charging system uses a three unit regulator. The cutout relay connects the generator when charging and disconnects the generator from the battery when the generator isn't charging. The current regulator controls current output and the voltage regulator protects the electrical system by limiting the voltage. Now, in our alternator charging system, the diode rectifiers eliminate the need for a cutout relay. As one-way valves, the diodes won't let the battery discharge back through the alternator. As for current control, the stator windings, the rotor, and the air gap between the rotor poles and the stator are so designed that the alternator is self-limiting with respect to maximum current output. As a matter of fact, when current flow in the stator windings tries to go above rated output, an opposing voltage is built up in the windings to restrict the excess current. Now this happens automatically, so there's no need for a separate current regulator. Therefore, the alternator's only need is for some way of limiting the output voltage. So a voltage regulator is used. It controls the voltage by regulating the current supplied to the field coil of the rotor. How is that regulator connected in the circuit? Yeah, that's a good question. The cover of the regulator is marked above the terminals. You'll find the letters IGN to indicate the ignition terminal and FLD to indicate the field terminal. You can't get this system wired up wrong, Alan. The terminals are different and won't fit any place except where they belong. Good, I like that tech. There's a connection from the field terminal of the regulator to the field terminal of the alternator. The connection from the ignition terminal leads to the ignition side of the ignition switch. Now, incidentally, there's a seven and one half ampere fuse in that lead. It protects the circuit against damage from an accidental short. Then there's a ground lead from the alternator to the regulator mounting screw on some models. Other models use a ground clip at the regulator. That ground is mighty important. Without a good ground, the regulator can't control the voltage. Good, I'll remember that. As far as the alternator charging circuit connections are concerned, the lead from the output terminal disappears in a wiring harness, but it completes the circuit from the alternator output terminal to the battery positive terminal. This might be a good time to explain the function of the ammeter, Barney. Yeah, you're right, Tech. The ammeter is placed in the circuit between the ignition switch and the battery. Therefore, it simply registers current flow into and out of the battery. Oh, I get it. The ammeter doesn't show the alternator output. With a fully charged battery, the ammeter registers zero because the alternator supplies the demand. Yeah, that's right. The car ammeter is no indication of alternator performance. Okay, that's clear. Now, are you going to show me how to test the charging system? Yes, but before I do, I want to be sure you remember one very important point. Before you connect any test instrument to any part of the circuit, always, and I do mean always, disconnect the battery ground cable. Now, if you don't, and should accidentally cause a short, you may burn out the fuse, damage the regulator, or the alternator. I don't suppose you would ever put a battery in backwards, Alan, but if you should, You'd burn out the rectifiers in this alternator so quick it would curl your hair. Okay, pal. I'll remember that. Good. Now let's turn this record over, unless you think you can read lips. Now we're ready to test the charging system on this Valiant. Specification for other cars will be found in the reference book. Diagnosis is based on three fundamental tests that can be made on the car. Now these tests must always be made with a fully charged battery and are made in this order. The charging circuit resistance test, the current output test, and the voltage regulator test. Okay, now let's get started. I've already tested the battery. Disconnect that battery ground cable first, remember? Yep, 
And I'll do that right now. First step is to disconnect the wire from the alternator output terminal. Then connect the ammeter leads to the disconnected wire and to the output terminal. Be sure the ammeter lead terminal doesn't accidentally short against the end frame. Connect the negative voltmeter lead to the positive battery terminal and connect the positive lead to the same wire that was disconnected from the output terminal of the alternator. Remove the wire between the field terminals of the alternator and the regulator. Connect a special jumper wire between the field and the output terminals of the alternator. Connect the battery ground cable. Start the engine and adjust the speed and the electrical load to get a 10 ampere reading on the ammeter. The voltmeter should show a drop of not more than two tenths of a volt. If it does, you'd better find the point of resistance and correct it before you go any further. That's a good point, Tech. Now, the next test is for current output. Stop the engine and move the voltmeter negative lead from the battery terminal to a good ground. Now, this test is going to tell you whether or not the alternator is okay. The jumper takes the regulator out of the circuit, so you're testing the output of the alternator. That's right, Tech. The test is run at 1,250 RPM, so you'll have to hook up the tachometer. No sooner said than done, Barney. Good. Start the engine, set the speed at 1,250 RPM, install a carbon pile rheostat across the battery, and adjust it to get a voltmeter reading of 15 volts. The ammeter should then read not less than 28 amps. If the minimum of 28 amps isn't reached, there's internal trouble, and the alternator will have to be removed for repair. It could be due to low field current, Barney. You could make a field current draw test before you remove the alternator. How's that done? Disconnect the field lead at the alternator. Connect the test ammeter between the field and output terminals. Current draw should be between three and three and a half amps. Less than that could mean dirty slip rings or brushes. Right. A heavier draw could mean a short in the field windings. There are some additional tests you can make on the bench, Alan. You'll find them spelled out in the reference book. Good, I'll look them over. I suppose the alternator gets a clean bill of health if it tests up to specifications, huh? Yeah, that's right. At this point in your testing, you know the alternator is right. So, if you have charging system troubles, you can be sure it is due to something in the regulator. Start the engine and set the speed at 1250. Turn on the lights or additional accessories as needed to get a 15 amp reading on the ammeter. Be sure the system has been run about 15 minutes, long enough to normalize temperature before you take voltage readings. Voltage specifications are based on temperature compensation of the regulator. So, make like a doctor and take its temperature. <laughs> yeah. yeah, take the temperature of the air about two inches from the regulator, Alan. Record the temperature and the voltage readings. Compare them with the table given in the reference book to see if the voltage is within limits according to the temperature. Ah, the next step is to turn off all the lights or other accessories and increase engine speed to 2200. The ammeter should read 5 amps or less with a fully charged battery. Voltage should not increase more than 7 tenths of a volt or less than 2 tenths over the previous reading. Is that 2 tenths minimum important? Oh, it sure is. That slight increase means you'll be sure of proper voltage control under light load at higher speeds, particularly during cold weather. If you didn't get a two-tenths increase, the car's ammeter needle might flop back and forth like crazy. I see. The owner would wonder what was wrong. Right. If the regulator comes up to specifications, you know it is set properly, and you won't have to adjust it. Now, if it does need adjusting, can you do it installed, or does it have to be removed? You have to make all adjustments with the regulator removed. It's smart to measure the air gap first, Alan. You're right, Tech. So remove the regulator, break the seal, and remove the cover. Inspect the contacts to be sure they are clean. Connect a 12-volt test lamp between the ignition terminal of the regulator and one post of a 12-volt battery. Connect the other battery post to the field terminal of the regulator. From the hinge side of the armature, 
insert a 48 thousandths wire gauge between the armature and the core. Push the gauge up against the nylon stops. Press the armature down against the wire gauge. The light should dim slightly. Uh, push on the armature, not on the spring reed that carries the contact point. Right. Now, remove the 48 thousandths gauge and insert a 52 thousandths gauge. Make the same test and the light should not dim. If you have to adjust the air gap, bend the bracket which carries the upper stationary contact. Yeah, that's right. But be sure to keep the contacts in alignment. After the air gap is properly adjusted, measure the clearance between the movable contact and the lower stationary contact. It should be 15 thousandths. And if there isn't, bend the bracket which carries the lower stationary contact. Now, when the air gap and the point gap are within specifications, I suppose we're ready to adjust the spring tension for proper voltage regulation, huh? That's right, my boy, but take it easy. A very small change in spring tension makes quite a difference. Bend the spring lower hanger up to decrease voltage, down to increase. Be sure the ignition switch is off when you connect the test leads, when you remove or install the cover, and when you adjust spring tension. Yeah, and another point. The cover has to be in place when you make the test. So you may have to remove and install the cover a couple of times before you get the right adjustment. Now, if you connect a ground wire from the base of the regulator, you can hold the unit in your hand when you take readings. Just be sure the cover is on and that the temperature and voltage agree with the table. I get it. And using that jumper ground is easier than installing the regulator on the car each time you make a test. But let me ask this question. Suppose the tests showed that there was trouble in the alternator. You mentioned some bench tests that could be made before you had to disassemble it. Going to cover those tests? Well, we're not going to have time, Alan. But you'll find all the details are covered in the reference book. In the meantime, here are some of the bench test highlights. There are these general conditions to check for. Open, shorted, or grounded field circuits, open or shorted rectifiers, or a grounded stator. To test for an open field circuit, you need an ammeter, a 12-volt battery, and a jumper. To test the rectifiers, you need a test lamp with a number 67 bulb, a 12-volt battery, and a jumper. To test for a grounded stator winding, you have to insulate the stator frame from the end frame, then use a 110-volt test light between each stator winding and the frame. Now, just a word of caution. This alternator won't motor, so don't connect a battery to it on the bench. You'll ruin it if you do. Okay, I'll remember that. Don't worry about those bench tests, Alan. They're all given in detail in the reference book. You won't have a bit of trouble. Oh, uh, I'm not worried, Tech. I can see that this is going to be an easy system to maintain. I understand it pretty well right now. I'm sure you do, Alan. You and the rest of the boys will be experts in no time. I'm sure our reputation of being tops in service is going to be maintained.